Good morning, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, good afternoon to Father John Baer. Uh, welcome back to these uh, 2021 um, Odin lectures. Uh, before turning things back over to Father John, I just want to um, make a couple of announcements. The first is a save the date for next year's Odin lectures. Um, so uh, put on your calendar January 13th and 14th, 2022. Uh, when, um, God willing, these lectures will take place on our campus again, uh, outside of Pittsburgh at Trinity School for Ministry, our lecturer for next year will be Dr. Michael Glarup, uh, the Executive Director of the Center for Early African Christianity. So we look forward to having him join us, and you'll uh, hear more about that throughout the coming year, but wanted to give you those dates. The other thing I wanted to announce is that um, if you have questions for Father John Baer throughout uh, this lecture, uh, or a question about the previous lecture, you can send them to eventquestions at tsm.edu. And after this lecture, uh, we'll present uh, some of those questions to Father John for his, uh, for his responses. I think that's everything I have. That email address, again, is eventquestions at tsm.edu. So without further ado, uh, I will turn things back over to Father John Baer. Uh, thank you very much, Father Jeffy. I'm sorry you had a video last night rather than me lecturing live. Um, before I start, immediately, uh, Russ, can you help me with a sharing screen? When I do the share screen, it just comes up with advanced sharing options. Uh, click on what you want to share and then hit the, the I, blue button there. That doesn't come up. Oh. Um, hmm. Let me see here one more time, see if for some reason it's... The only, the only button I get that comes up is advanced sharing options with the question, who can share and who can start sharing when somebody else is sharing? That's strange, because you should have full... I'll just make you the host and that should give you the <laughs> screen share button down at the bottom there. Right. Okay. So hopefully there's a now where you would see like mute start video. <laughs> Got it. Good. OK. OK, um, thank you very much, everybody. And it really is a joy to be with you. And I'm looking forward to today to being able to be with you live, if only virtually, um, and to having some good discussion, questions, and interaction afterwards. We did a lot in the lecture last this day evening on the question of where we are today with regard to life and death, the way that various people have looked at it, and then we turned back to look at some of the martyrdom literature to see how they viewed it. And one of the most striking things they viewed about it was really that quotation from St. Ignatius on his way to martyrdom in Rome, where he says, I'm not yet born, the birth pangs are upon me, hinder me not from living by trying to talk me out of it. Allow me to follow the passion of my God. When I will arrive there, I will become a human being. He's not yet born, he's not yet living, he's not yet human. I suggested and mentioned briefly that the background for that is the Gospel of John. And so what I want to do today is to turn specifically to the Gospel of John and Christ's words from the cross that it is finished. So to actually look what is finished in the Gospel of John. And then we'll turn to Irenaeus to consider how he sees the whole economy of God as one single economy viewed from the light of that end. So to start, the Gospel of John. To really understand the distinctiveness of John, we really have to consider how it differs from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the Synoptic Gospels. And this is a difference which was known and recognized really from the beginning. In Clement of Alexandria, for instance, in a statement repeated by Eusebius, he says that while the Synoptic Gospels recorded the events of the Gospel of Christ's life, John gave us their interpretation. It is the spiritual gospel written by the theologian. Now we've become so used to reading all four gospels alongside each other or after each other. And then we read the book of Acts and then we read the epistles and then maybe we read the apocalypse that we might forget that John did not write his gospel to be followed by Acts. Very straightforward. He did not write it to be followed by Acts. No, of course, Luke wrote his gospel to be followed by Acts. Luke wrote his gospel as a two-part work. Let me close this. 
even if it's a two-part world. If anything, the Gospel of John goes together with the apocalypse as a two-part work. And we've got papyrological evidence from the early second century that in fact they were bound together. Peter Leithart has recently suggested that in fact, not only do they form a two-part work, but they form a two-part royal romance. The gospel, he says, presents the bridegroom. So after the prologue of the gospel of John, it starts on the third day, obviously a reference to the resurrection, it starts with a marriage feast. But at that marriage feast in Cana, Jesus says, my hour is not yet. He meets various women along the way, none of whom turn out to be the bride. John the Baptist is identified in the Gospel of John as being the friend of the bridegroom. And then finally, the bridegroom is revealed upon the cross, with John, the one who wrote the Gospel, standing at the foot of the cross. So the bridegroom is now revealed over the course and especially at the end of the Gospel of John. But then the question is, if he's a bridegroom, where's the bride? Peter Leithart points out that the apocalypse starts with the same John in the same place at the foot of the throne upon which is a slain lamb. The cross is the throne. But now John speaks in a different register, in an apocalyptic register. And then the, apos the apocalypse concludes with the marriage feast. So that if the gospel is the revealing or the preparation, the unveiling of the bridegroom, the apocalypse is the preparation of the bride. The woman who appears giving birth to the child, the body is built up by fulfilling the number of martyrs, and then it culminates at the end with the marriage feast. Absolutely fascinating, but exploring that further will take us off our theme for today. We'll see some aspects of it though. So the Gospel of John, the spiritual gospel, really is distinct from the synoptics. And we miss its character if we don't pay attention to this. Missing the character of the Gospel of John was done so egregiously by that German biblical scholar Ernest Kaisermann in his book, which was translated into English as The Testament of Jesus in 1968, so not too long ago. According to Kaisermann, the Gospel of John had no place for the passion. It really was, as he puts it, I'm quoting him, a mere postscript, which had to be included because John could not ignore this tradition, but yet he couldn't fit it organically into his work. In the Gospel of John, he argues, we no longer have the unknown Messiah of the synoptics, but we have the divine Lord striding over the face of the earth, resulting, as he puts it, in an understanding of incarnation that is little better than naive docetism. <laughs> I mean, really. And that, that is his characteristic characterization of the work which is known as the incarnational gospel, naive docetism. Clearly something is wrong. And it's historically wrong in a really profound way. And I'm gonna start with that because it will help us understand the characteristic of the gospel of John. What's really interesting is that we know more about the disciples of John than for any other apostle or evangelist. That great scholar in the 19th century, J.B. Lightfoot, argued that the disciples of John form such a tight group that he could speak of them as a school, the school of John. He pointed out that Peter and Paul formed communities. John formed a school. We don't have anybody, for instance, in the way that we have Irenaeus referring to Polycarp, who sat at the feet of John, Irenaeus sat at the feet of Polycarp. We don't have anybody saying that for Peter or Paul. So in the first generation of the school, we have Polycarp, Papias, perhaps Ignatius. In the second generation, we have Polycrates of Ephesus, Melita of Sardis, and above all, Irenaeus. And as a matter of fact, and this is where Kaisman was so wrong, as a matter of fact, it is pretty certain that it was in this school amongst the disciples of John that the annual celebration of the Lord's Pascha, Easter, was first observed. They were the ones who first kept Pascha as an annual feast, and they kept it on the 14th of Nisan. 
They are later known as a quarter decimans, a nice fancy Latin word which simply means the fourteeners. They kept the feast on the 14th of Nisan, whatever day of the week. Only by the end of the century, the second century, because of a controversy in Rome, only did this celebration begin to be celebrated on the following Sunday. And at that point, we start to have a three day Pascha. And at that point also, Sunday takes on the character of the day of the resurrection. In all the previous writers, Sunday is primarily the Lord's day, an anticipation of the eschatological day of the Lord. It's the first, first day, it's the eighth day, it's the beginning of the new creation. It's not known as the day of resurrection until that Lord's day coalesces with the celebration of this annual feast of Pascha on the 14th of Nisan, now moved to a Sunday. And we have, an example of how they celebrated Pascha with Melito, Melito of Sardis, his work on Pascha, a really, really beautiful text. It's our earliest liturgical text. And in fact, it's the earliest Passover Haggadah, the, the narrative which would accompany the meal, the cedar, the earliest one we have, either Jewish or Christian. The Jewish ones all date from a couple of centuries later. In defending the practice of celebrating Pascha on the 14th of Nisan, they trace it back to John, especially Polycrates of Ephesus, who wrote a letter to Victor of Rome explaining why they kept the feast this way. We do it because John did it, and he describes John as being the disciple who lay on the breast of Jesus, and I'm quoting, he was the priest wearing the petalon in Jerusalem. Now the petalon was a gold leaf with the name of the Lord that the high priest would wear in the temple upon his head only once a year as he entered the Holy of Holies. He was, according to Polycrates, John was a high priest wearing this golden leaf with the name of the Lord that the high priest of the temple would only wear once a year as he entered the Holy of Holies. <laughs> which is really such a striking assertion. There have been all sorts of attempts to try and figure out what he means. You know, was he really saying that John was the high priest in the Jerusalem temple? Is he speaking metaphorically about the way that we are all priests of the Lord, a royal priesthood and so on? Well, it really seems kind of historically implausible. No other evidence to speak about the high priest in the Jerusalem temple being John. But on the other hand, to say that it's simply a reference to the way that we are all a royal priesthood doesn't really capture the force of that word that he wore the petalon in the temple. I think that what, Polycar uh, what Polycrates is doing is to say, yes, he's a high priest, but in the Gospel of John, the temple has been reconfigured, as we'll explore in a minute. Remember, at the beginning of the Gospel of John in chapter 2, Christ says, destroy the temple, and I will rebuild it in three days. People don't understand, and then it's pointed out, he's speaking about the temple of his body. So the temple is now his body. And this is played out across the gospel with all the different liturgical feasts that John mentions, much more than any of the others. We'll look at them in a minute. Culminating with Christ's exaltation in glory upon the cross, He's crucified on the 14th of Nisan in the Gospel of John, when the lambs are slain, not the day after, as in the synoptics. And when he's crucified, John is standing at the foot of the cross as the high priest, as the lamb is slain. So we have this really emphatic paschal character to the Gospel of John, liturgically, theologically, every aspect to it. Now, what's particularly important in all of this for us today is that this celebration of Pascha, of Easter, as it was practiced from the beginning in the school of John, as we see it in Melito, this celebration took place on a single night. It was a single feast encompassing all aspects, crucifixion, burial, resurrection, ascension, and also Pentecost, 
all held together on a single night celebration. And in this way, it actually points to something in the Gospel of John and really takes its lead from the Gospel of John. Because in the Gospel of John, which if you remember, as I pointed out, was not written to precede Acts with its description of Ascension and Pentecost. In the Gospel of John, Christ is in fact lifted up in glory upon the cross. When I am lifted up, then you will know, ego in me, I am. When I'm lifted up, I'll draw all people to myself. And he's lifted up when he wills and as he wills. And then from the cross, his throne of glory, it, uh, the Gospel of John says, he handed over the spirit. Uh, not as we usually translate it or uh, understand it. He handed over his spirit. There's no his, it's the spirit. And it's not in a similar register as Matthew, Mark and Luke, where we hear it as his life came to an end. No, he's been exalted in glory upon the cross. And from the cross, he bestows the spirit. And then eight days later in the upper room, he tells the disciples, receive the Spirit. So if we're to understand Pascha, the passion of Christ in the Gospel of John, we must take seriously its unity in the starkest contrast imaginable. The cross is the throne of glory, manifesting the one who conquers death by his death. Single event, single feast, one night. I mentioned how by the end of the second century, this became a three-day Pascha. And then over the following centuries, it developed into a whole week-long celebration with Palm Sunday, the washing of the feet, the crucifixion on Golgotha, the burial, the resurrection. And then it goes out to beyond a week of the ascension on, on the Mount of Olives, Pentecost, and you have all the time before that preparing in Lent, you get a whole liturgy of space and time develops. And although we assume that liturgy of space and time, because we've inherited it for the last 1500 years, that liturgy of space and time could only really unfold after Constantine. Only then could, when you've got a Christianized city, could you go over here for Palm Sunday, over here for the foot washing, over here for this uh, celebration on Golgotha and so on. But even when it unfolds in this way, its unitary aspect is still kept. The Sunday of resurrection is still Pascha, single word, single feast. I think the best way to think about this really is as a pure white light. The Pascha of Christ is a pure white light, which over time is refracted, as it were, through a prism into a spectrum of colors. Now, when I say that pure white light is refracted, I don't mean to imply some kind of disintegration, the falling apart of an original unity and so on. I mean it positively. As that single white light is refracted into a spectrum of colors, we're able to appreciate each color in its distinctiveness. But we have to remember that it all holds together as that single pure white light. Otherwise, it falls apart. Then it becomes Christ died because he's human, but because he's God, he's able to raise himself from the grave. Two separate things, no longer proclaiming, trampling down death by death. Now, interestingly, the imagery for all of this, the iconography, develops slower than the liturgical development. So the earliest images we have, in fact, depict a living Christ upon the cross. Here we've got the doors of St. Sabina in Rome. And Christ, as you can see, he's, his body's straight, his head's upright, his arms are also extended in the form of prayer. He's living. It's not a dead figure. He's living. Likewise here, the Lateran reliquary box with scenes from the life of Christ from the 6th century. There's a detail of that. Again, arms straight, eyes open, body upright, head upright, he's living. And the other classic image is from the Rebula Gospels. Head slightly inclined, yes, but he's clearly still upright, arms stretched, living. 
Yeah, that's the Rebula Gospels from the sixth century. So the earliest depictions of Christ upon the cross are as the living one. And that wasn't because Christians, as is sometimes argued by art historians, were unwilling to depict him as dead until after Chalcedon, when we differentiate between his divine nature and his human nature and all the other kind of dogmatic developments. It's not that. It's because this is the living one, giving life through death, trampling down death by death. Only by the 7th to 8th century do we then get a depiction of the dead Christ on the cross, images which, you know, are much, much more familiar to us. This is a Byzantine image, a modern one, but clearly it's um, a recognisable figure. And we then have to look at, say, okay, what's actually being depicted in this figure? The background for this depiction, I would argue, is in fact John 3. If you remember in John 3, uh, as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. If we go back to that image, you can see he's not just simply dead, but he's depicted in a serpentine figure, he's, you know, in the shape like that. Okay, uh, the background is John 3, as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. The background for that is Numbers 21. The people of Israel had come across the Red Sea. They've left Egypt behind. They're in the desert and they keep complaining. They keep complaining. Why are we here in the desert? It's foolishness. We're going to perish. We've got no food. We've got no clothing. We've got no housing. It would be better to go back to Egypt. Yes, we were slaves, but at least we had sustenance. When the people start complaining, God then afflicts them with a plague of deadly snakes and you have to ask well why deadly snakes well it's because the sin of the israelites was that they were complaining they've got poisonous tongues and so god afflicts them with poisonous tongues when the snakes bite them um, they begin to die moses speaks to god intervene intercedes with god and is told in numbers 21 Make for yourself a snake and set it upon a sign. Moses made a snake of bronze and put it upon a sign. So John's got the imagery in the background. What's striking is that um, God doesn't simply remove the snakes. Instead, he cures them from the bite of the snake by another figure of a snake. So it's poisonous tongues of the Israelites, poisonous tongues of the snakes, and the healing for that is the form of a snake set upon a sign. And when John speaks about that, John changes the word in numbers, it set it upon, thes, or put it upon, estes, and stand it upon. What John has done is take Numbers 21 and interpret it by Isaiah 52. My servant shall understand and he shall be exalted, ipsothesite. So he's using this exaltation to using that word and that imagery from Isaiah 52 to understand Numbers 21 about the snake, not simply put upon a sign, a pole, but rather lifted up. So John 3.14, as Moses eeps off them, lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up. When I'm lifted up, you will know that I am. Okay. The background, you, know, you can take this imagery for the snake further back. Um, the clearest further reference to it would be Genesis. You've got a snake on the tree promising us life, but giving us death. Christ is the antitype of that. He's our snake on the tree, giving us life through death. So playing with all that imagery. And in fact, the imagery that he plays with is even broader than that because the symbol of the snake lifted up in a pole is, and was known by everybody, a symbol of the doctor. It's a sign of Asclepius, and still is today. So everybody would have known this as being the sign of salvation, the sign of healing, the sign of restoring life. So we get then the single image of the living Christ on the cross, as we have it in the fifth, sixth century, then becomes seventh, eighth century, the image of the dead Christ on the cross, and almost simultaneously, you get images of the resurrection. 
like that. You, you know the images of the resurrection. That's the one from the church in Hoya. These are later, but the imagery goes back much earlier. Uh, one of the earliest ones we still have is uh, from the Studios Monastery, um, 12th century, Christ standing like that and so on. But note with both of these images of the anastasis, resurrection, anastasis, it is not in fact Christ who's being raised. We tend to think the resurrection is simply Christ getting out of the tomb. But no, the earliest images are of the risen Christ raising Adam and Eve, the whole human race. Only later, when you start to get Middle Ages, when you start to get an image of Christ stepping out of the tomb, only at that point do these earlier images no longer get called resurrection, but they get called the harrowing of hell. But technically, they are still the image of the anastasis. So we go from a single image of the living Christ on the cross, and it's bifurcated, if you like, to an image of the dead Christ on the cross and an image of the resurrection. Here's a, one from the Princeton Psalter from the 11th century, which puts the two side by side. The dead Christ on the cross and the resurrection. And the resurrection is again Christ standing on the gates of hell, which are placed in the form of the cross, lifting up Adam and Eve. But notice he's still got the same form, the same figure as a crucified one. He's standing, he's got his arms outstretched, and he's lifting up. So the single image of the living Christ has refracted, bifurcated through, as from the pure white light of that image to a twofold aspect, the dead Christ on the cross and the resurrection, where the resurrection is a lifting up of the human race, but it's still maintaining the form of the crucified one even in the image of the resurrection. So um, the initial feast of Pascha as celebrated by the disciple of John get bifurcated into this whole liturgical cycle, the whole Paschal cycle in the fourth, fifth century. And it gets expanded even further to encompass nativity and all the other things, but that's beyond our time uh, for today. So if we want to understand the gospel of John, we must hold all of that together. It is the one lifted up upon the cross, voluntarily laying down his life out of love, an action which is his action voluntarily. For this reason, the Father loves me, that I lay down my life to take it up again. But a, an action of his love, which traces itself back to the very love of God. In this way, God loves the world, to go back to John 3.13. In this way, God loves the world that he gave his son for us. It's an act of love. Although in the Gospel of John, it starts with the, um, with the Baptist saying, behold, the Lamb of God. There is no theme of atonement being played out across the rest of the Gospel. It's totally an, a free, gratuitous, uncaused expression of the love of God himself. Okay, there's one further aspect that we need to also pay attention to if we want to understand the Gospel of John more fully. And that is, in the Synoptic Gospels, the most striking aspect for me of the Synoptic Gospels is the fact that the disciples continually fail to understand who Christ is. They're with him. They're walking around with him. They're hearing his teaching. They're seeing his miracles. They heard whatever his mother had to say. All of that and yet they still don't get it. Even when Peter seems to get it in Matthew, when he's at Matthew 16, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, he says to Christ when asked, who do you say that I am? Peter still doesn't get it because he tries to stop Christ going to Jerusalem to suffer. And then he's told in no uncertain terms, get behind me, Satan. So they're with him all that time. They just don't get it. Even when one of them seems to get it, he still fails. Then they abandon him at the cross. They deny him. They don't initially understand the significance of the empty tomb. After all, an empty tomb is ambiguous. What does it mean? Has someone stolen the body? And they even fail to recognize the risen Lord when they encounter him. 
every encounter with the risen Lord involves a turning. Something has to happen before they recognize him. And most important in all of that, from the synoptics in order to understand the Gospel of John, is Luke 24. On the road to Emmaus, the, the two of them are walking on the road to Emmaus, the risen Lord turns up, they think he's a stranger. They start telling him all the things that have happened. Are you the only one who doesn't know what's been going on and all of that kind of thing? Only then when he upbraids them, foolish men, only then when he begins to open the scripture to show how Moses and all the prophets spoke about the son of man and how he had to suffer to enter into his glory, only then do their hearts start to burn. They persuade him to stay the night, they break bread, their eyes are opened to recognize him in the breaking of the bread. And as soon as they recognize him, he disappears. So the two, as Luke 24 puts it, actually following Paul, Corinthians 15 and Corinthians 12, the two modalities of encountering Christ and knowing who he is, is the opening of the scripture and the breaking of the bread. Only in this way do they know who the crucified and risen one is. And that he wasn't the one that they thought they were following who's going to save Israel from Roman rule or whatever else they were thinking about. Now the reason why that is important for understanding the Gospel of John is because the Gospel of John starts with the scriptures being opened. It starts with the disciples knowing that it speaks about Christ. After the prologue we have um, the verses regarding the Baptist. And you have in John 1 36, the Baptist said, behold the Lamb of God. He's saying that not because he sees a fluffy white animal walking towards him, but because he's already understanding who Christ is, the Lamb of God, with all the scriptural references to that. 38, two disciples call him rabbi, which means teacher. 41, Andrew says to Simon, we found the Messiah which means the Christ. Most strikingly in 45, we found him of, of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of man. Already in John 1, 45, Philip is interpreting Jesus as the one about whom Moses spoke and the prophets also. But notice, it's still Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. They haven't quite yet reached the depth of understanding even though the scriptures are open for them. 49, Nathaniel, Rabbi, you are the son of God, you are the king of Israel. King of Israel being the, um, the title of Christ on the cross in the synoptics. And then to this really amazing crescendo of titles given by the disciples to Christ, Christ responds, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You there in the singular. You shall see greater things than these, the you there's in the plural. And he said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, plural, you will see the heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So all of those things are not sufficient. You'll see greater things than these. And what you'll see is a heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And what's striking about that is that in the most immediate literal sense, that's not actually described in the Gospel of John, unless you know what he's talking about at the cross, the heavens are opened and so on. The other fascinating thing is that he talks about the angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man, referring back to Genesis and Jacob ladder, Christ is the ladder which unites heaven and earth. But the question still is, why is it that the angels ascend and then descend don't we always shouldn't don't we typically think of angels descending before they ascend but we could talk about that if you want to There's so many things in, in the gospel of john to do all of that so john starts with the disciples already trying to understand christ by reference to the scriptures as philip and nathaniel in verse 45 there but then he takes it to a whole other level you will see greater things than this. And it's this that enables John to present Christ and his work quite differently to the synoptics. So in John, Christ is always 
the Lord from above. You know, on every, throughout the gospel, I'm from above, you are from below. He's a transcendent Lord all the way through the Gospel of John. That, that things only happen when he wills them to happen at his time. It's that character of the Gospel of John that gave Ernest Kaiserman to describe it as being docetism. He's missed the, the mark about what it is. In the Gospel of John, there's no transfiguration, as there is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Because in the Gospel of John, we see him transfigured on every page. In the Gospel of John, the passion only happens when he's ready. He is the one measuring its time. In the Gospel of John, he goes voluntarily to the cross. He doesn't even seem to struggle in Gethsemane. Yes, he says, now my soul is troubled, but he doesn't struggle and sweat tears of blood like it says in the synoptics. Rather, he says, where, where in the synoptics it says, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass. Now in the Gospel of John, he says, what should I say? Let this cup pass. No, for this reason I've come. Presented very differently. And in the Gospel of John, finally, as I've already mentioned, his elevation upon the cross is his exaltation in glory. So John's got a different starting point. Compared to the synoptics, the scriptures are already open. You know, John's typically thought of as being written later than the synoptics, so he's building on what they've done, but wants to take that reflection to a whole higher level as he presents Christ in accordance with the scriptures. Now, in narrating all of this, John plots his narrative in a very different way to the synoptics. In the synoptic gospels, they only mention the Passover once as a setting for Christ's passion. Luke also mentions that his parents went up to Jerusalem every year for the Passover, but that's it. That's the only point of reference that we've got in the synoptics. In the Gospel of John, on the other hand, we've got six different feasts over the course of Christ's life. So firstly, we've got the Passover, I'm sorry the type is so small there, um, I'm going to read it anyway. So first, the Passover of the Jews, which is at hand, so that Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Chapter two. Second, chapter five, a feast of the Lord, of, of the Jews, when again, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. It is the only feast which is um, where the term doesn't have an article with it, the feast. It's just a feast. No indication about what feast it was. But in the context of chapter five, the man by the pool with the five porticos was healed on the Sabbath. So something connected with that. In chapter six, we've got the third mention of a feast. And it's a second mention of, a, of the Passover, the feast of the Jews was at hand, 6-4. This time Jesus doesn't go to Jerusalem. He remains away. He's beside the Sea of Galilee and he crosses over to Capernaum in the evening. Then fourth, chapter seven, we have the feast of the Jews, the tabernacles. This time, Jesus went up to Jerusalem, not publicly, but in private. And then you got references to the middle of the feast and the last day of the feast, the great day. Apart from the healing of the blind man on the Sabbath in chapter nine, there's no further indication of time until we get to chapter 10. So really seven, eight, and nine all belong together as being the Feast of Tabernacles and the different aspects of the Feast of Tabernacles, the middle of the feast, the last day of the feast, and the Sabbath around those days. Okay. Then fifth, chapter 10, 20, verse 22. The Feast of the Dedication in Jerusalem, the fifth feast to be mentioned, during which Jesus was walking the temple in the portico of Solomon. After that feast, Jesus returned to the place where he first began his ministry, and he never returns to the temple again. And finally, sixth, the sixth feast to be mentioned is the third and the final Passover. And it's plotted, every chapter after the Feast of Dedication plots it with reference to this. In chapter 11, it is, was near. Chapter 12, it's six days away. And then it's the point before which Jesus eats with his disciples, speaks with them and prays to the Father. 
chapter 13, knowing that his hour had come to depart out of the world to the Father. And then all the discourses in chapter 19, at the day of preparation, the Passover, about the sixth hour, he's crucified. Okay? In the Synoptic Gospels, they have their last supper, the Passover meal, and he's crucified on the following day. In the Gospel of John, he's crucified on the day of preparation for the Passover, about the sixth hour, so already in the afternoon towards the evening. That's when he's crucified. Uh, it's not really that they are simply confused chronologically, rather they're making different points. We've been told from the beginning of the Gospel of John that he's a Lamb of God. Well, if he's a Lamb of God, when else is he going to be crucified apart from when the lambs are slain on the day of preparation for the Feast of the Passover? Then after these six feasts, these six temporal and festal indicators, we have a seventh, the temporal markers of his appearance to Mary Magdalene on the first day of the week, to the disciples without Thomas on the evening of that day, and then again eight days later to the disciples with Thomas. It's, it's striking he doesn't use the language of three days. He knows the language of three days. We had it with the, with the marriage in Cana on the third day, and also in chapter two with regard to destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. So he knows that language, but when it comes to describing his resurrection appearances, it's on the first day, the evening of that day, so tying it towards, and then eight days later, the first day and the eighth day. So we've got six feasts, for four of which Jesus is in the temple, culminating in his crucifixion on the day of preparation, followed by a new beginning with the risen Christ on the first day and the eighth day. John clearly has arranged his presentation of Christ in a highly sophisticated and liturgical manner. Five of these six feasts are also connected with actions and words that identify Christ as the temple and the fulfillment of the feasts celebrated in it. So the first mention of Passover in chapter two is a setting in which Christ talks about the temple that he would raise up three days after its destruction, speaking about his body. So the very first mention, we're identifying the temple with the body of Christ. The second mention of Passover in chapter six leads into a whole discussion on the following day about the bread of life that descends from heaven and is his flesh. The last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, Christ identifies himself as the living water. And in the following morning, he identifies himself as being the light of the world. Living water and the light are key themes for the feast, the Feast of Tabernacles. So it's not about what's going on in the temple, it's about Christ himself. He is the source of living water. He is the light of the world. When we come to the Feast of the Dedication in chapter 10, it is not the temple that is dedicated, it's Christ who's dedicated. Here he says, I've been consecrated by the Father. The last feast before his passion. And then finally, at the Passion itself, Christ is presented finally as the temple. And the Lamb being slain in the temple. Moreover, the sequence from chapter 5, when Jesus goes to Jerusalem, to his final departure from the temple in chapter 10, it begins with the weekly Sabbath, and then it proceeds through the liturgical year. Passover in the first month, Tabernacles in the seventh month, dedication in the ninth month. So there's no need to rearrange the material of the chapters of John, as for instance, Bultmann and others have suggested, to try and smooth out his geographical itinerary. You know, they, they were wondering why he's over here, then he's over here, they rearranged it to try and make a more sensible geographical itinerary. No, it's not a geographical itinerary, the sequence is the sequence of the liturgy of the temple. What is announced in chapter two, destroy this, uh, the temple in three days I'll raise it, is completed through the course of the liturgical year at the Passion, when he bestows a spirit upon the mother and identifies himself with the disciple standing unashamed at the foot of the cross. Woman, behold your son. 
And then he shows himself to his disciples on the first, first day and the eighth day, fulfilling his promise that he and his father will make their home in those who love him, their Ikea, their dwelling place in those who love him. So it's Christ and his body, his extended body, that is now the temple. So we did all that fairly, fairly quickly to show how John has thought about and arranged the material and presented Christ in a very particular way. And in doing that, of course, he's going back to scripture. In the Gospel of John, Christ says very simply, if you believe Moses, you believe me because Moses wrote of me. So what John is doing is looking back to Exodus, where after having been instructed in seven speeches of the Lord on the mountain about what he, Moses, was to build, that seven speeches from Exodus 25 to 31, echoing the seven days of creation, instructing Moses what he's to build, at the end of Exodus 40, the, after Moses has done all of this work, uh, Exodus concludes, Moses finished all the work and the cloud covered the tent of witness, the skinny to martyrio, the tent of witness. The word witness there is the same word as martyr, to martyrio, of the martyr, the tent of martyrdom, the tent of witness. And the tent was filled with the glory of the Lord, such that Moses couldn't enter it because the tent was filled with the glory of the Lord. So Exodus ends. But now, however, we know this is but a copy of what Moses saw on the mountain. The tabernacle there, the temple that followed it, is a copy of the true tabernacle of witness, the true skinny of martyrdom, and the glory of the Lord. This is Christ himself. So John's looking back to Moses, the Moses who wrote about me, to present Christ. Going back to Exodus, Leviticus as well, the feast and so on. But John's not simply going back to this book of Moses, to Exodus. We also know from the beginning of the opening of his gospel that he is going to be going back to Genesis. He deliberately tells us that with the opening words of his gospel, which play off the opening words of Genesis in the beginning, in the beginning. So John's telling you, when you read the gospel, think about Genesis. So just like Isaiah, John looks back to the things that were spoken of from of old, but only revealed in the end. And then in addition to the true tabernacle, the true temple, not made by hands, that is Christ himself, we should look further back in Moses to the opening words of scripture, echoed by the beginning of the gospel. So when we go back to the opening words at the beginning of Genesis, we can now note a really striking uh, difference in the way that God's work is spoken about there. Scripture, as we know, Genesis, begins with God issuing commands. Let there be light. Let there be a firmament. Let the earth bring forth. It's always let there be. It's an imperative. This imperative, this divine fiat, let it be. This speaking imperatively is sufficient to bring everything, all these creatures into existence. So it's let there be light, and there was light. A little bit more, and it was good, end of the day, next day. It goes through the days of creation, speaking everything into existence. <clears throat> but then having spoken everything into existence by his word alone, if you like, setting the stage for his work, God then does something different in verse 26. He changes from using the imperative to using a subjunctive. We tend to always get hung up on the plural, let us. Okay, yes, plural, yes, trinity, and so on. But the real difference is the, the change from the imperative to the subjunctive. Let us make the human being in our image and likeness. This is the only thing which God specifically deliberates about. This is the only thing which is said to be his purpose, his resolve. So with scripture opening 
with this announcement of the particular project of God, we can now hear a further dimension to Christ's last word from the cross in the Gospel of John, to Teleste, it's finished. And before that, Pilate's words, as Christ goes, the only in the Gospel of John, as Christ goes to the cross, behold the human being. So scripture opens with, let us make the human, everything spoken into existence is a scene upon which God is going to act, enact his project, let us make the human being. And the conclusion of all God's work is behold, a witness to unwittingly by Pilate, behold the human being, idu o anthropos, eke homo. And then from the cross, Christ says, teteliste, which we often hear as it's come to an end, you know, my particular work is finished. We hear it in the way the synoptics talk about him breathing his last and so on. But the word teteliste really means it is finished. It is completed. It is perfected. So the particular project of God, God to create a human being in his image and likeness is not accomplished simply by issuing a divine fiat then and there. He doesn't say, let there be a human being. Rather, it depends upon the fiat of Christ, not my will, but thine. And those like Ignatius, as we saw yesterday, who also in Christ give their own, let it be. Discussion about the relationship between the seven days of creation and John's presentation of Christ seem to go back to the very, very earliest days, perhaps even with John himself. We've got mentions in some of the second century writers about how the disciples gathered together with John in the late nine, in the mid nineties in his old, extreme old age and encouraged him to write his gospel and spoke with him about all of that. Um, Irenaeus and Victorinus of Petau independently record a tradition which probably goes back to Papias and the elders in Asia who met John, they both recall the tradition about the seven ages of Christ's life. Affirming, they both affirm that John had informed them that Christ had reached the age of a teacher, that is between 40 and 50 years. They both affirm that, you know, as strange as it might seem to us, they both affirm that yes, he must be between 40 and 50. After all, in the Gospel of John, he's asked a question. How have you seen Abraham and you're not yet 50? Well, you don't say that to somebody who's only 30. According to Victor Venus, in the words which I say, which probably go back to Papias at the end of the first century, he says, Christ consummates his humanity, humanitatem consumat, in the number seven. Birth, infancy, boyhood, youth, young man, maturity and death, the number seven. Irenaeus talks about how Christ goes through the whole of human life to sanctify each age for each age. Infancy, birth, and so on. Birth, infancy, boyhood, adulthood, maturity, death. Um, we've got other witnesses to the fact that Papias was the first one really to talk about the seven days of creation and also to relate the male and female in Genesis 1.27 to Christ and his church. Okay, so we've got witnesses to that in, in ancient times. In modern times, there have been some attempts to try and correlate the structure of John's narrative to see the seven days of creation being played out over specific parts. Some argue that John 1, 19 to 2, 12 can be divided into seven days, or chapters 1 to 5 into seven days, or the gospel as a whole, or perhaps correlating it to the seven signs that are worked by Jesus, correlating that to the seven days. But none of them are really substantial. None of these suggestions really um, are satisfactory. There's nothing as satisfactory as John's liturgical structure, as we've, we've noted. He gives us deliberate liturgical markers all the way through. But there are, however, points in the Gospel of John, points prior to the passion and Christ's words to Teleste and Pilate's words behold the human being, there are points in which um, we can see that, that this is indeed what John was thinking. So bearing in mind what we saw yesterday about Ignatius being born into life as a human being by following Christ in his passion. From Blandina, written by Irenaeus, about the virgin mother 
giving birth to living children of God. The example of Blendina, by which the dead, the stillborn, return to life through their martyrdom, giving great joy to the Virgin Mother. And also perhaps what I said earlier about Peter Leithart and his idea of the gospel and the apocalypse being a two-part royal romance, the bridegroom and the bride. Bearing all of that in mind, the most important figure for seeing this in the Gospel of John is the figure of the woman, the woman, simply called the woman. She appears at Cana when she, she's called his mother by John, but Jesus addresses her as woman. Woman, what have you to do with me? My hour is not yet. By John, she's called his mother. By Jesus, he's called, she's called woman. My hour is not yet. When the hour has come at the foot of the cross, there's a really interesting, sh subtle shift in vocabulary, just like we, I just said with regard to Cana. When written about by John, it is his mother. When addressed by Jesus, it's woman. So John 19, 25, 26. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, Imitia uh, Aftu, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. The RSV then has, when Jesus saw his mother, but it's not his anymore, it's simply the mother. When Jesus saw the mother and the disciples whom he loved standing near, he said to, again, it's not his mother, it is the mother. Woman, behold your son. So when John's describing the scene, it is his mother. When John's adopting the perspective of Jesus, it is the mother. And when Jesus addresses the mother, he addresses her simply as woman. Okay, so woman, what have you to do with me in John 2, marriage of Cana? Woman, what have you to do with me? The hour is not yet, my time is not yet. John 19, his hour, he again addresses her, woman, behold your son. The son is finally born. Okay. This woman appears one further time between Cana and the cross, and that is in the words of Christ in John 16, when he is comforting his disciples as he's about to depart. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will, your sorrow will turn to joy. When the woman, simply the woman, is in travail, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she's delivered of the child, Pithion, she no longer remembers the tribulation, for joy that a human being is born into the world. So you have sorrow now, but I'll see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. Okay, really, really interesting language. It's the woman again. But notice how it says, when the woman is in travail, she has sorrow. Is sorrow really the right word for a woman in travail? Later on, when it is... Um, after she's delivered the child, she no longer remembers the tribulation, the thlipsis, the affliction. That's a better word. So what's sorrow doing here? When she's in travail, she has sorrow. And then there's also a change. When she's delivered of the child, the word there is pedion, she has joy that a human being is born into the world. And there it is, anthropos. The RSV again mistranslates it. It says, for joy that an infant is born into the world, or joy that a baby is born into the world. No, it's joy that a human being is born into the world. So the woman whose hour was not yet at Cana, and whose hour is there at the Passion, this woman in John 16 is the link between the two. She's now in travail. And this travail of the woman contains this transition from being delivered of a child to a human being is born into the world. So although Christ is painting a parallel between the disciple's sorrow at the departure of Christ and then the woman's sorrow during her, her travail with both turning into joy, 
As I pointed out, sorrow is really an unusual word to use for a woman in travail. In an article on this, Judith Liu asks, specifically about this verse in John 16, so is this a birthing or a dying? We meet birth here only when we encounter death. Remember, in the Gospel of John, his birth is not described. We meet birth in the Gospel of John only when we encounter death. Indeed, the birth, which is not narrated in this Gospel, becomes through John 16, 21, the birth becomes a death. Or is the death a birth? Or should we say, is death in fact the birth, the birth into life, as we saw with Ignatius, Blandina and the others? Okay, so we've got the woman in, in Cana, we've got the woman in John 16, we've got the woman in, uh, at the cross, and finally at the cross she hears the words, woman, behold your son. There's all sorts of plays that, that John is doing here with regard to Genesis, in these words of comfort and crucifixion, the, 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 the comfort and then the crucifixion scene. Tertullian points out, for instance, he says, as Adam was a figure of Christ, Adam's sleep sketched out the death of Christ, who was to sleep a mortal slumber, so that from the wound inflicted upon his side, Christ's side, might be figured the true mother of the living. So what he's doing is saying, as Paul says, Adam is a type of the one to come. Adam is a type of Christ. And so Adam's sleep foreshadows Christ's death. And so as Eve came forth from the side of the sleeping Adam, so too the church, the true mother of the living, comes forth in the form of blood and water from the side of Christ in mortal slumber. Moreover, just as the woman in Genesis 3 is promised sorrow, lippi, in childbirth, 316, just as a woman was in John 16. So the word sorrow is really coming from Genesis 3, now interpreted in this way. And then in Genesis, when Eve finally does give birth in Genesis 4.1, it's specifically a human being, Anthropos, that she acquires from God. Ektisamen, Anthropon, Viatutheu. Just as it is a human being that is born, in John 16, 21. But then, although Adam calls the woman Eve, in the Septuagint, the word Eve is simply Zoe, life. She's called Eve because she's a mother of the living, Genesis 3, 20. In fact, all her children die, for which the word sorrow rather than travail is a more appropriate term. So it applies to mental anguish, not to physical pain. So the church turns out to be the true mother of the living, or our mother, as Paul puts in Galatians, as Christ is a true human being, and Adam but a type of the one to come. The church is a true mother of the living, acquiring as living human beings those who, following Christ, are born through their martyric death, anticipated by baptism, and partaking of the Eucharistic cup. There's a further play that's going on, I think, between Genesis and the Gospel of John. If you think back to Genesis 2, where this Tertullian is playing with it, in Genesis 2, God takes a clay from the earth, breathes a breath of life in it, makes a living human being, places him in the garden to work it. Then says it's not good for man to be alone. Eventually, he takes a rib from the side of sleeping Adam, builds the rib up into a woman, and then leads the woman to Adam. Okay, we all know that. The question you have to ask, though, is who would Eve have thought Adam to be when she saw him? Well, without psychologizing it or imagining it, the only way we've been, Adam has been identified to that point, he's taken from clay, made a living being, and then he's placed in the garden to work it. He is the gardener. So too, when Mary, different Mary, but still Mary, approaches the risen Christ in the Gospel of John, she thinks he's a gardener. So John's playing with Genesis, both Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, in all these different ways, to describe 
the creation, the new creation, maybe simply the creation that's effected through Christ. So God's purpose, spoken about by Isaiah, who is like me? Let him stand, let him call, let him make ready for me, inasmuch as I have made the human being forever. This is completed with Christ's passion upon the cross. It's completed when creatures give their own fiat, let it be to God's own purpose, following Christ in Christ, just like Ignatius did, becoming witnesses, becoming martyrs, no longer trying to secure our own life for our own security, but rather taking up the cross and living by dying. Or as Paul says in 2 Corinthians, as dying, behold, we live. Another passage from Isaiah 43.10. Be my witnesses, martyrs, martyrs, be my witnesses, martyrs. I too am a witness, says the Lord God, and the servant whom I have chosen. Be my witnesses, be my martyrs. So the Gospel of John the Theologian encompasses the beginning and the end of all the work of God as Christ's it is finished brings to completion God's own purpose the living human being, the glory of God, the tabernacle in which the glory of God dwells, all the things we can say about that. The unity of flesh and spirit in the living human being, when the spirit adorns the flesh with its own properties, so that it's not one flesh but united to the Lord as one of spirit, this is the final marriage celebrated in that paschal feast. Another point of reference, there are several of which we could do, but just another point of reference from John 5. In John 5, Christ says, my father is working still. My father is still working and I am working. It's because he says my father is working still and I am working that leads the Jews to seek to kill Christ for making himself equal to God. As the dialogue continues, Christ then specifies what the father does. And what the father does, working, is raise the dead. This is the work that the father does. He raises the dead and gives them life. And the son seeing this does this likewise. So in John 5, the question about working on the Sabbath is not just simply about, you know, can you do a work on this particular day? It's a claim that the father is still working and that Jesus and the father are doing the same work and specifically, the Father raises the dead and gives them life. So the question of working has become incredibly increased in scope. The work in question is to bring life out of death. So when Genesis says on the sixth day, God finished all his works, and on the seventh day, he left off from all his works and rested, John reads this as referring to the hour that is yet to come when the work is finished on the cross, Christ rests in the tomb on the blessed Sabbath and life comes through death. So the true Sabbath rest is Christ's rest in the tomb, celebrated in that feast of Pascha God ceases from his work, for his project is now complete. In the Byzantine tradition, on Holy Saturday at Matins, we sing this hymn, uh, at the most solemn moment. We sing it on Friday evening and again on Saturday morning. Uh, Matins for Holy Saturday, liturgy for Holy Saturday. Moses the Great mystically prefigured this present day, saying, and God blessed the seventh day, for this is the blessed Sabbath. Not this is like the blessed Sabbath. It's not, you know, God did seven days, six days of work and then rested way, 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 way back when. No, God is still working, Christ says, and he's working, raising the dead. Um, and the son does likewise. Moses writes of me. And so when Moses is speaking about uh, the Sabbath, he's mystically prefiguring today, the Sabbath, the, the Paschal feast, on which we say this is the blessed Sabbath. This is the day of rest on which the only begotten Son of God rested from all his works. Through the economy of death, he kept the Sabbath in the flesh, 
and returning again through the resurrection is granted us eternal life, for he alone is good and loves humankind. So that's what I see going on in the Gospel of John and how it forms a background for what I touched on yesterday with the martyrs, with Ignatius and with Blandina, um, yeah, and, and all the things one could say about that, and how much it challenges our current understanding of what life and death, and indeed what being a human is. Now, for various reasons, this way of reading scripture now seems really foreign to us. Yeah. Although Christ simply says, Moses wrote of me, we still read of, as we still read Moses as talking about the events which happened way, 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 way back when. And I think that the reason why we do that is because we've got a book called the Bible, which we absolutely have to remember the apostles and the evangelists didn't, nor did the fathers of the church, nor in fact did anybody really until the invention of the printing press. Yes, uh, Constantine asked Eusebius to prepare for him 50 codices with all the scriptures in them, but that was exceptional, um, really exceptional. The, it's not something that everybody would have had in the way that we have it today. And part of it is we now have a Bible which is also conveniently divided up into the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the New Testament is ordered as life of Christ, Acts, then the letters of Paul, then the Apocalypse. So I think our mental framework for thinking about scripture, reading scripture and doing theology is probably something like that. We've got a book called the Bible, which narrates creation fall all the way through up to the time of the New Testament where we have the incarnation, Ascension, Pentecost, and so on. Um, and then church history thereafter that. And the ironic thing is we think that we're being historical when we're reading it along that line. Yeah, we're starting with the Old Testament and then coming to the life of Christ in the Gospels and then coming to Acts and then coming and, and so on and so on. But as we've seen from the beginning, the, the earliest Christians read scripture quite differently. In fact, I'm trying to get all my students to stop calling the Old Testament the Old Testament. If the term scripture was good enough for Christ, for Paul, the apostles, the evangelists, and the Nicene Creed, I think it's a good enough term. Not only is it a good enough term, as soon as we call it Old Testament, we've relegated it. No, it's the scriptures, and it's by these scriptures that the disciples come to know who he is. They're the most important text speaking about him. And this, I would argue, is absolutely intrinsic to the proclamation of the gospel. So as Paul puts it here, he says, Now according to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the apocalypse of the mystery." which was kept secret for long ages, but is now made manifest and made known through the prophetic writings. According to the command of the eternal God to all the nations to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory forevermore. So the gospel, the preaching of the crucified and risen one is proclaimed through the opening of the scriptures, is made manifest and made known through the prophetic writings. As Paul would put it, only now, having encountered Christ, having encountered the gospel, having seen the crucified and risen one, is the veil finally lifted from the writings so that we can know what it was Moses and Isaiah were in fact speaking about. Okay, So the gospel is the apocalypse of the mystery made known through the prophetic writings. Only then, subsequently, does it find written expression and when it finds written expression, it is first of all in the letters of Paul. And although Paul speaks frequently about the gospel, he never really at any point says, this is the gospel, A, B, C, D, E, whatever. No, his letters are more correct. If you misunderstood this point or that point. So the opening of the scripture, the light of the passion, the proclaiming of the gospel through the prophetic writings, then the letters of Paul, then the gospels. And note, they're all called 
gospel, and they're all called the gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where the word gospel refers back to the preaching that's been going on uh, from the time of the apostles. So the historical and hermeneutical framework for reading scripture really is not Old Testament followed by New Testament, but the scriptures which are unveiled by Christ, the book is opened for us to be able to see the mystery which was hidden in them through the long ages, but is now proclaimed through the apocalypse, the unveiling of the mystery. Okay, and now we can read scripture as the narrative of salvation. But when we read scripture from Advent to Christ as a narrative of salvation, our starting point for that is in fact Christ himself, because he's the one for whom the scriptures have been opened so that we can now read it as a narrative from Adam to Christ. Uh, in the light of which we can now say Adam is a type of the one to come. We can now say Adam sinned, death came into the world, Christ's righteous life came into the world. We can only say that when the scriptures are opened. This has really, really significant implications. To go back to this um, diagram we've got here, if we start with creation and then go to the fall and then the long history leading up to Christ, what we have effectively done is make Christ plan B. You know, God created everything way, way, way back when, that was the end of it, we messed up, God had to respond with this whole history of salvation culminating in Christ, so Christ would be plan B, a response to the mistake we have made. But, you know, quite straightforwardly, Christ is not plan B. As I said, Paul asserts Christ is a type of the one to come. <laughs> so that, in fact, the one to come exists with God before Adam. The word type comes from the Greek word tipto, meaning to hit. If you think about a seal and wax, you hit the wax with the seal, you create an imprint. That's a type. This is a prototype. The prototype must exist before the, the imprint. So Christ, according to Paul, is the image of the invisible God. Adam is only made in the image, the image that is Christ. It's only now because of his encounter with Christ that Paul can read scripture unveiled and is able to say, through the sin of Adam, death entered into the world, through Christ, life and righteousness. But that was not how he was reading scripture previously, when he was persecuting Christians for their obvious heresy, and in fact persecuting Christ himself. When Christ encounters him, confronts him really, uh, on the road to Damascus, Christ confronts him by saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Total identification with the believers. So the starting point for reading scripture is the opening of the books, the lifting of the veil by the one about whom Moses and all the prophets spoke. I'm emphasizing this so forcefully, as much as I can, because if we don't grasp that point, it'd be really difficult to see how Irenaeus and others de develop the points that we're going to be looking at, Irenaeus especially, um, but also, what John was doing with the work of God in Genesis being complete with Christ on the cross. But Irenaeus, disciple of Polycarp, disciple of John, standing in that stream, Irenaeus gives us, you know, the most expansive exposition of all of that um, in his work against the heresies. And he does so in really, really striking words. Most particularly here, in Against the Heresy 3.22.3, he says, since the Saviour pre-exists. It was necessary that he who would be saved should come into existence, so that the Saviour doesn't exist in vain. And it, that is almost totally contrary to the way that we typically think. We came into existence, we messed up, God sent the Saviour. No, he puts it the other way around. The Saviour pre-exists, the Saviour is eternal, and so it was necessary that the one to be saved should come into existence. Otherwise, what would be the point of a saviour? 
Yeah, so we are brought into existence to be saved. Creation and salvation belong simply together. It's not plan A, plan B. Creation, we mess up, salvation, plan B. Creation and salvation belong together as a single economy of God. Such that, in fact, creation, God's project, is only complete at the end. Look at how he puts it here. I'm going to be giving several long passages from Irenaeus. Um, in fact, most of this is one sentence, which is why it was difficult to break it up. And even then, not starting at the beginning. It's such a long sentence that I've bolded some and underlined others so that we can see how, how Irenaeus is coordinating his words because that shows us also the pattern of how he is thinking. So you've got to kind of hold it all together. So he says, just as from the beginning of our formation in Adam, the breath of life, having been united to the handiwork, animated the human being and showed him to be a rational being. So also at the end, the word of the Father and the Spirit of the Father, having become Spirit of God, having been united with the ancient substance of the formation of Adam, rendered the human being living and perfect, bearing the perfect father. Okay, so just as, so also, and notice here is just as, so also, just as Adam is animated and imavid by a breath at the beginning, so at the end, the word and the spirit becoming united with the ancient substance renders a human being living. The whole movement from Adam to Christ, from beginning to end, is a movement from animation to vivification, from living by a breath of life to living by the life-giving spirit. He's following what Paul does in Corinthians 15, where Paul contrasts Adam and Christ. Adam is animated by a breath, Christ is, brings, is the life-giving spirit. Okay? Movement from breath to life. A breath of life which is intrinsically mortal, a breath expires. Yeah? Um, the question is, how are we going to use our breath to take up the cross, using our breath to take up the cross, to live not for myself, but to live for others? In which case we move from Adam to Christ or trying to hold on to our breath, trying to stay in Adam, in which case, no matter how well we try and hold on to our breath, it will expire. Okay, so just as, so also, but that's a subordinate clause to in order that, just as in the animated we all die, so also in the spiritual we may all be vivified. For never at any time did Adam escape the hands of God, to whom the Father speaking said, let us make the human being in our image after our likeness. And for this reason, at the end, not by the will of the flesh, nor by the will of man, but by the good pleasure of the Father, his hands perfected a living human being in order that Adam might become in the image and likeness of God. So breath to spirit. In the animated we die, a breath of life is inherently mortal, it will expire. But in the spiritual one, we are vivified, which we, with a life which comes through death and therefore cannot be touched by death. And this is a whole process in which we are continually being worked over by the hands of God, the hands of God for Irenaeus being Christ and the Spirit, the Word, the Word and the Spirit. It's to them that the Father the speaking, saying, let us make the human being. We never escape the hands of God. We're constantly being worked over so that at the end, his hands will have perfected a living human being. And we in Adam will have become in the image and likeness of God at the end, not at the beginning. Okay? Christian theology works technically eschatologically, not protologically. There are two, two particular aspects of this singular economy, a singular economy of creation and salvation together that I'd want, I'd want to highlight. Firstly, because its starting point is the passion of Christ as that singular event that we spoke about through which the scriptures are unveiled. Because the starting point is that, 
the, apostle, uh, the, the economy includes from the beginning apostasy and death. From the beginning includes apostasy and death. Look how Irenaeus does it. He says, this is from book three, chapter 20. Again, it's, uh, it's going to be three slaves or four slaves. He starts off by saying, God therefore was long suffering when the human being defaulted, foreseeing the victory which should be granted to him through the word. For when strength was made perfect in weakness, the word showed the kindness and the transcendent power of God. For just as he loves these, just as, so also in order that. Just as he did bear Jonah to be swallowed up by the whale, not that he should be swallowed up and perish altogether, but so that, having been cast out again, he might be more subject to God and might glorify him the more, who had conferred, the God who had conferred upon him such an unhoped-for salvation and brought firm repentance to the Ninevites, that they might convert the Lord who had delivered them from death when they were struck with awe by the sign which had been wrought by Jonah, on Jonah. So, a couple of things here. Um, it's from the beginning that he swallows Jonah. He allows Jonah to be so he, he allows he allows Jonah to be swallowed up by the whale, but it's not he lets Jonah be swallowed up by the whale and then tries to figure out what he's going to do. He allows Jonah to be swallowed up by the whale, not to kill him, but so that when he's cast out, he might be more subject to God and more obedient to God. Okay. Um, the God who had conferred upon him such an unhoped for salvation, unhoped for on the part of Jonah, but clearly already foreknown, pre-existent with God. God wasn't making it up as he went along. So also, from the beginning, God did bear the human being to be swallowed up by the great whale, who was the author of transgression. Not that he should perish altogether when so engulfed, but arranging in advance a finding of salvation which was accomplished by the word through the sign of Jonah. For those who held the same opinion as Jonah regarding the Lord, who confessed and said, I am a servant of the Lord, I worship the Lord God of heaven, who made us see in the dry land. So also, in order that the human being, receiving an unhoped for salvation from God, might rise from the dead and glorify God and repeat, I cried to the Lord my God in my affliction, he heard me from the belly of hell, that he might always continue glorifying God and giving thanks without ceasing for the salvation which he obtained from him, that no flesh should glory in the Lord's presence, nor should the human being ever adopt an opposite opinion with regard to God, supposing that the incorruptibility which surrounds him is his own by nature, nor by not holding the truth should boast with empty superciliousness as if he were like they were, were by nature like to God. So, from the beginning, God did bear the human being to be swallowed up by the whale. It's not that God creates us in that condition, because as he continues, um, the whale was the author of the transgression, the serpent, the whale, the same kind of images going on there. He allows this to happen, not that we will perish altogether, but he arranges in advance the finding of salvation accomplished by the word through the sign of Jonah. Yeah. All of that so that the human being receiving an unhoped for salvation from God might rise from the dead and glorify God. And hope, an unhoped for salvation, unhoped for by the human being, but already arranged in advance by God uh, in the sign of Jonah. Okay, so always the salvation comes first, and then the pedagogy is being worked out through that. God allows us to be swallowed up from the beginning by the great whale, the author of the transgression, so that, like Jonah, we might emerge and glorify God, never adopt an opposite opinion with regard to God. We should, so that we realize that life doesn't belong to us, but to God, and now actually learn to receive it from God. What's particularly striking in all of this is that Jonah, we're used to thinking of Jonah as being a type of the Lord, three days in the belly of the whale, three days in the belly of hell, simple. But now Jonah is also at the same time an image of the human being. The human being uh, swallowed up by the whale from the beginning, 
awaiting this unhoped for salvation. So that Jonah represents the, the perishing human race and the savior simultaneously, which is mind blowing when you think about it. And the reason why he can do that is because going back to the point we started with, Christ has trampled down death by death. So death is both uh, that which needs conquering, but death is also the means of victory. Death is a condition in which we're in, but death is actually the solution to the condition which we're in. When it's a voluntary death following Christ. Then he carries on. Uh, the, uh, I mean, I mean it carries on, the next paragraph. Such then was the patience of God, that the human being passing through all things and acquiring the knowledge of death. If you read book three in the Antinicene Fathers series, it has the acquiring the knowledge of morality, because there's variation in the Latin text between moralis and mortalis, between morality and death. And in Victorian times, I guess it suited them more to think about acquiring a knowledge of morality. But clearly it has to be acquiring the knowledge of death because of the next line, then attaining to the resurrection from the dead and learning by experience from whence he's been delivered, may thus always give thanks to the Lord, having received from him the gift of incorruptibility and may love him the more, for he to whom more is forgiven loves more and may know himself how mortal and weak he is. We don't really get it until we're dead in the ground that we are in fact mortal and weak with no life in and of ourselves. But in that experience of weakness, because the whole thing is predicated on that strength made perfect in weakness. So when we know how mortal and weak he is, also understand that God is so immortal and powerful as to bestow immortality upon the mortal and eternity upon the temporal. And that he may also know the other powers of God made manifest himself and being taught by them may think of God in accordance with the greatness of God. For the glory of the human being is God, while the vessel of the workings of God and the all his wisdom and power is the human being. So that's the pedagogy, the patience of God, instructing us through all things from the beginning through to our death and resurrection in Christ. Um, with Jonah representing the lost human race and the savior, both in the belly of the whale. Now the working out of this overarching economy within the framework of the lifespan of each particular human being is dealt with by Irenaeus in book four, chapter 37 to 39. Here he provides what he describes as being an exposition from the scriptures of the ancient law of human liberty, that God created the human being free, having from the beginning power over himself. Now fundamental to his argument is the point that only creatures created with freedom are capable of initiative and response. And in this way, they're capable of growing. So time is also at stake here. They're capable of growing and thereby changing the mode of their existence, growing into the immortality of God. He starts off by citing many passages from scripture to demonstrate human freedom, a freedom, he says, which extends to faith. Faith is within the scope of our freedom, he holds, and the corresponding responsibility and accountability that follows on from this. He then turns to those who would deny it, his opponents, the Gnostics. He says, they present the Lord as being weak, unable to accomplish what he willed or that the Lord was ignorant, that some people are merely material and not able to receive immortality. His opponents divided the human race up into three different categories of people, the saved, the damned, and those in between. And then he draws out the presuppositions of his opponents with a question. He says, but they, uh, sorry, but they say, they being his opponents, but they say, he should not have created angels such that they were able to transgress, nor human beings such that they immediately became ungrateful towards him because they were created rational, capable of examination and judging, and not 
like irrational and inanimate creatures, which are not able to do anything of their own will, but are drawn by necessity and forced towards the good, with one inclination, one bearing, unable to deviate without the power of judging and to be unable to be anything other than what they were created. That, that is what they say God should have done, not cap creatures capable of, of rejecting him. You know, as Isaiah, as God says in Isaiah, I've, I've begotten sons, but they've rejected me. No, they, he, his opponents say, he should have created those that don't have that free will, but are rather drawn by force and necessity towards the good, one inclination, one bearing, unable to deviate, and that last line, unable to be anything other than what they were created. But Irenaeus says, if that had been the case, it would have benefited neither God nor human beings. Communion with God would not be precious. It wouldn't be desired. It wouldn't be sought after. It would be by nature and not as a result of their own proper endeavor, care or study or love. As such, it would be misunderstood. No pleasure would be found in it. And then Irenaeus continues by quoting, quoting Christ's words in Matthew, the violent take it by force. Paul's exhortation to run the race. Both of these emphasize the need for struggle on the grounds that um, endeavor heightens the appreciation of the gift. And then he continues, as it lies with us to love God the more, the Lord has taught and the apostle has handed down that this will happen with struggle. For otherwise, this our good would be unknown and not the result of striving. He gives an example. He carries on by giving an example. I'm paraphrasing all these chapters, book four, chapter 37 to 39. He gives by way of an example, the faculty of seeing sight is desired more by those who know what it is to have sight and then lose it, rather than those who've never been without it. Those who've had it and lose it desire it the more. So also health is prized more by those who know what disease is. Light is, desired, is known by contrast with darkness and life by contrast with death. So for Irenaeus, the whole economy from beginning to end as we've already seen it symbolized with Jonah, has been arranged in such a way that human beings come to know their own weakness. Because it's in knowing their weakness that they simultaneously know the strength of God. Having known the experience of death, they might hold ever more firmly to the source of life. He then continues this analysis by contrasting two different types of knowledge. You've got the knowledge which is gained by hearsay on the one hand. I can tell you that, I don't know, Paris is the capital of France, never having been there. And on the other hand, the kind of knowledge which is only gained through experience. He points out that it's only through experience that the tongue comes to learn of both bitterness and sweetness, and only by tasting honey, sugar in our case, that we know what sweetness is and we can contrast it to bitterness. Without experience, no matter how much I tell you, you've never tasted anything sweet, you have no idea what I'm talking about. And then he continues, it is likewise only through the experience of both good and evil, evil being disobedience culminating in death, only through the experience of both that the mind receives the knowledge of the good good which is obedience to God which is life. So by experiencing both and casting off disobedience through repentance, the human being, just like Jonah, becomes ever more tenacious in obedience to God, the source of life, growing into the fullness of life. The alternative to this, Irenaeus says, in really striking words, is that he says, if anyone shuns the knowledge of both of these and the twofold perception of knowledge, good and evil, sweet and bitter, and so the twofold perception of these, forgetting himself, he destroys the human being. There really is no place in Irenaeus' understanding of the economy of God for 
as you like, an ethics of preventative abstention, as one scholar put it, an ethics of preventative abstention. The mixed character of our life upon earth, which is always mixed, we always are fighting between good and evil. This is intrinsic to the pedagogy, which is the economy of God, the pedagogy by which we are brought to become human beings. Returning to 437.7, Aeneas continues that, therefore the heavenly kingdom would be more precious to those who've known the earthly kingdom. And if they prize it more, they will love it more. And loving it more, they would be glorified more by God. And then he concludes this section. God, therefore, has borne all these things for our sake, in order that, having been instructed through all things, henceforth we may be scrupulous in all things. And having been taught how to love God in accordance with reason, logos, remain in his love. God exhibiting patience in regard to the apostasy of the human being and the human being being taught by it. As the prophet says, your own apostasy shall heal you. Your own apostasy shall heal you. Again, back to the kind of paradoxical play like we saw with Jonah. Jonah is a symbol both of the problem and the solution. So the apostasy is our problem, but it's through that apostasy Death is a result of our apostasy. God did not create death. Death is a result of our apostasy. When we see it in the light of Christ, you have to say, but then it also becomes a means of solution, strength and weakness. And then Irenaeus continues by placing this all together in one whole picture. God thus, determining all things beforehand for the perfection of the human being and towards the realization and manifestation of his economies, that goodness may be displayed and righteousness accomplished, and that the human being may be conformed to the image of his son, and that finally the human being may be brought to such maturity as to see and comprehend God. So human disobedience, apostasy, and death is, for Irenaeus, inscribed into the very unfolding of the economy. Because remember, the economy is only ever understood from the light of Christ's passion. Death results from human action, no doubt about it, or the, as he put it, the, um, the great whale, the author of the apostasy. Death results from human action, but it is nevertheless a result which is subsumed and transformed within the larger arc of the economy, as the economy brings a creature made from mud to share in the very life, glory, and power of the uncreated, so demonstrating the goodness and the righteousness of God. It's worked out in and through the life of each human being, if they respond with faith and thankfulness, yet the conclusion is also corporate. The conclusion here is that the church may be conformed to the image of his son, so it's both individual and corporate. In this way, we are brought to see and comprehend God. In 438, he analyzes the question from a slightly different angle. He suggests that, well, perhaps God could indeed have created a human being perfect from the beginning or as a God from the beginning, because surely all things are possible to God. But he points out, created things simply by virtue of being created unnecessarily inferior to the one who created them. They fall short to begin with of the perfect. They just come into existence, they're infants compared to the one who brings them into existence. As created, they're initially infantile. They are unaccustomed, unexercised in perfect conduct. He gives another example. It would be perfectly possible for a mother to give meat to a newborn infant, but it really wouldn't do the infant any good. So he says, it was possible for God himself to have made the human being perfect from the beginning, but the human being could not yet receive this, being as yet an infant. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that um, I don't know, God's omnipotence is restricted by the nature of that upon which he's working. No, he's working to bring it to the state he wants it to be. 
nor should it be taken as implying that somehow the infantile state is somehow imperfect, but simply that he's not yet reached the stature to which growth will bring it. A newborn infant may well have perfect legs, but won't be able to walk. It needs time and growth. By definition, the created cannot be uncreated, but more importantly, the omnipotence of God is demonstrated for Irenaeus in the way that the created is brought through time to share in the uncreated life of God as shown by Christ. It's a change in the fashion or mode of their existence or mode of life. And this change, remember we saw earlier that, that his opponents wanted a creature who could not change. No, only by a creature which changes can we grow and mature through preparation and training to enter into the mode of life that is God's own mode of life as it's been shown to us by Christ. And this is what the whole of the economy, including disobedience and death, effects. There is also no end to this process. We never become uncreated. The perfection of the human being, he says, lies in a continual responsiveness to the creative activity of God through which he says we are brought to share in the power of the uncreated and then he summarizes it all with these really beautiful words in this musical res resonance by this order and such rhythms and such a movement the created and fashioned human becomes in the image and likeness of the uncreated God the Father planning everything well and commanding, the Son executing and performing, the Spirit nourishing and increasing, the human being making progress day by day, ascending towards the perfection that is approaching the uncreated one. For the uncreated is perfect, and this is God. Now it was necessary for the human being to be created, and having been created to increase, and having increased to become an adult, and having become an adult to multiply, and having multiplied to become strong, and having been strengthened to be glorified, and being glorified to see his master. For he, for, for God is he who is yet to be seen, and the vision of God produces incorruptibility, and incorruptibility renders one close to God. Really beautiful, beautiful music, rhythm, movement, throughout the course of the whole human life, the course of the human life of the human race as a whole, as we approach God, the God who is yet to be seen, the vision of God produces incorruptibility. You have to be very careful with that line about the vision of God. His other line, which is quoted, his most frequently quoted line, the glory of God is a living human being. We all know that line, but he continues, the life of the human being is to see God. Well, no one sees God and lives, so the living human being he's talking about is a martyr, the one who sees God um, through his death, entering into that state and thereby producing incorruptibility, the incorruptibility here which renders us close to God. So such is the rhythm and the movement of human life, which recapitulates the movement of the economy. It recapitulates it in the life of every human being. We can no more escape its pattern or anticipate its conclusion, then we can expect a newborn baby to live in an adult manner. So he says, irrational are those who, who do not await the time of increase and ascribe to God the infirmity of their nature. He says they don't know either God or themselves. They're insatiable and ungrateful. They are unwilling to be at the outset as they've been created, human beings subject to passion. They want to be gods from the beginning rather than undergo this process of growth. He then carries on by quoting the two verses from the Psalm. I say you are gods, sons of the Most High. Emphatic, you are gods, sons of the Most High, but you will die like humans. I say you are gods, sons of the Most High. So he quotes on this verse, um, 438.4. This verse, he says, sets forth both truths. By his kindness, he graciously gave good and made the human being self-governing like himself. Yet by his foreknowledge, he knew the weakness of human beings and what would come of it. Yet by his love and power, he conquered the substance of our created nature. He gave us this, you are gods, but we're not yet able to sustain it. So we will die like human beings as a culmination of the growth that we've been talking about. 
the growth which culminates in entering into that Paschal mystery to see and be with God in that incorruptibility. Finally, then, well, not quite fine, we've got a couple more to do. Um, in 38.4, he sketches the whole thing out. It was necessary first for nature to be manifest, after which for what was mortal to be conquered, swallowed up by immortality, the corruptible by incorruptibility, for the human being to be made in the image and likeness of God, having received the, the knowledge of good and evil. What's really striking there, and we, we've seen the other parts of it already, but here he's taking Genesis 3.22, where the serpent says, uh, so where God says, behold, the human being has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Yeah, the, the, Adam and Eve follow the serpent, uh, they're persuaded by him, they eat from the apple, um, and then God responds to that by, behold, the human being has become one, like one of us, knowing good and evil. Usually we take it in some kind of ironic sense, perhaps. Irenaeus takes it as spoken without any irony, but as a statement of, the, of just how, how it is that the creature made from dust, coming to know both good and evil, rejecting the latter through repentance, finally becomes a human being in the image and likeness of God, like one of us. So to become human in this way, cannot be done by setting our own agenda, wishing, as he, his opponents want, wishing even now to be like God. Such an attempt would demonstrate an ignorance of all that we've seen. On the one hand, that Christ has revealed himself, that God has revealed himself in Christ as a perfect living human being dying for others. And on the other hand, the comprehensiveness of the arc of the economy through which the creator brings his handiwork to this stature by themselves undergoing the long pedagogue of the economy culminating in death and resurrection. So to become a living human being, a God upon this earth, we must allow ourselves to be fashioned by God through being open and responsive to his creative activity. He then concludes his whole chapter 437 to 39 with a really, really beautiful passage and we'll end with that one. He says, how then will you be a God when you are not yet made human? How perfect when only recently begun? How immortal when in mortal nature you did not obey the creator? It's necessary for you first to hold the rank of human and then to participate in the glory of God. For you do not create God, God creates you. If then you are the work of God, await the hand of God, who does everything at the appropriate time, the appropriate time for you who are being made. Offer to him your heart, soft and pliable, and retain the shape with which, his fa with which the fashioner shaped you, having in yourself his water, lest you turn dry and lose the imprint of his fingers. By guarding this confirmation, you will ascend to perfection. The mud in you will be concealed by the art of God. His hand created your substance. It will gild you inside and out with pure gold and silver, and so adorn you that the king himself will desire your beauty. But if becoming hardened, you reject his art, and being ungrateful towards him because he made you a human being, ungrateful that is towards God, you have lost at once both his art and life. For to create is a characteristic of the goodness of God, to be created is a characteristic of the nature of the human. If therefore you offer to him what is yours, that is faith in him and subjection, you will receive his art and become a perfect work of God. If you do not believe in him and flee from his hands, the cause of imperfection will be in you who did not obey, not in him who called you. For he sent royal messengers to call the people to the feast, but those who did not obey deprived themselves of his royal banquet. So for the hardening of God, uh, so for the handiwork of God to be fashioned to the stature of Christ, the truly living human being, rather than hardening itself, trying to be what it wants to be, we must remain pliable, 
open and responsive to the creative work of God. We are clay in the hands of God. Remember the quotation from the first lecture from the letter of Barnabas, the human being is earth that suffers. We're being molded throughout the whole of the economy so that in the end, we might be perfect in the image and likeness of God, living human beings. So the span of our life individually, just as the span of the economy of God as a whole, from beginning to end, from creation to salvation, or salvation as creation and creation as salvation, is understood by Irenaeus as a pedagogy in which we learn to become human, to become malleable clay in the hands of the creator. Whether we in fact do so depends upon us, however, and our reaction to suffering. Human beings are earth that suffers. Whether we offer our hearts with thankfulness to God who has shown his love to us in the cross of Christ and invites us to share in that love in and through our own suffering so that we become the vessel of his working or whether we reject all of that and harden ourselves, rejecting the work of his hands and so become brittle and useless clay. So the beauty of human beings, as we saw in the first lecture, with Nussbaum's analysis of Odysseus lies precisely in that vulnerability and fragility. To seek to transcend the basic fabric of human life, either by defining the only appropriate activity of human beings to be intellectual contemplation with the Greek philosophical tradition, or even as is more likely today with some kind of ethics of preventative abstention would be as Irenaeus puts it, to destroy the human being by one's own choice in reaction to what is and a reaction that is in more sense than one, all too human. Thank you. Thank you, Father John, for uh, that theological and spiritual and scriptural feast that you've uh, provided here in the second lecture. Um, I think for the time being, we'll take uh, just a few questions here that have been sent in, uh, maybe a couple from last night's lecture and a couple from uh, from this morning as well. So uh, without further ado, let me pull those up. So here's a question uh, from last night from Sharon. If I am understanding you correctly, we only truly become human through death, but this is not only our physical death, but death to self now. What does death to self look like in everyday life? Okay, um, I'm, I'm gonna take this opportunity to expand on a whole bunch of things. Yeah, so if it cut me short, it was on, yeah? Um, we only truly become human, you know, but we also, obviously we speak of ourselves as human already now, and we speak about, you know, a newborn baby is human, of course we do. Yeah, it really comes down to a question of how you define what it is to be human. So if you define a human being as having, I don't know, two legs, two arms, and a mouth that can talk, well, a newborn baby can't yet do that, but it's, yes, yeah, so, so it's not human as that definition is, um, but we still use the word human for it. It's got to grow to be able to walk and talk, yeah? If we define humans as, as uh, ancient Greeks would do, a rational animal, well, most toddlers I've met are not yet rational animals. They can walk and talk, but a lot more work to be done on that, yeah? If, but we still call them human, of course we do. If on the other hand, you mean by a human being, one in the stature of Christ, who shows us what it is to be human by laying down his life for his neighbor, for us, well, that requires not only learning how to walk and talk, how to be rational, it requires primarily growth in virtue. Yeah, so it's growing in all of that. And that's kind of the pedagogy that I was talking about today. It's not growth in virtue as in becoming ever stronger in one own, one's own self-reliance, which is how we tend to think of it. You know, I've got this virtue, I'm going to get the next virtue, next week I'm going to get patience, the week after I'm going to get chastity, I'll get all my Cub Scout badges and then won't I be good? <laughs> no. We strive after virtue, and, and striving after virtue, we learn in fact that we're more broken than we ever thought we were before, and in that way we learn humility, a broken and a contrite heart, which is actually that 
which God wants from us, a broken and contract heart, because only a broken and contract heart can receive the love of God and shed it to others. So that kind of thing, that's the scope. Yeah? But if that's what it is to be human, that requires an awful lot of growth culminating in our own actual death, where we finally experience strength and weakness, like I spoke about at the Irenaeus today. Um, sometimes when I talk like that, people will say, well, why don't you just go kill yourself then? <laughs> yeah. you know, we're looking at, the, at the, 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 those letters from Ignatius, and sometimes people get really turned off by Ignatius because he seems to be too keen on his martyrdom. Yeah? We have to be absolutely clear. The church has always taught from the beginning you should not seek out martyrdom, emphatically. Ignatius was already being taken to martyrdom when he's writing these letters, and he's reflecting on what's going to happen to him and doing all of that. Okay, so it's a different situation. But to answer the question then, uh, you know, why not just go kill yourself? Is that where you finally become human? I would respond with the word of Paul, where he says, yes, it would be better to depart and be with Christ. Of course it would. But nevertheless, for your sake, I'm here. Yeah. In other words, to depart, and, to, to self inflict that to depart and be with that suicide that would be selfish it would not in fact be the kind of martyric death we're talking about whereas for your sake i'm here is yeah that really is that martyric life. my life is now no longer my own it's for you yeah for your sake i'm here and the way that can play itself out I don't know, the whole of Christian spirituality is talking about that. You know, everything from disciplines of fasting, loving one's neighbor, you know, everything is really playing out that dynamic. Yeah. But we tend to not think of it in terms of those dynamics. You know, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. These are all the rules I've got to do. No, it's not a matter of following rules. It's a matter of taking up the cross and learning that life of, of service to others, self offering to others. Yeah. You know, every aspect of our life can be done that way. Yeah, to the point I wouldn't even know where to begin. <laughs> okay. Um, another question here. Uh, this um, appears to have been sent in a little bit before your first lecture. So um, huh. uh, depending on, this is from Jeff, uh, depending on who you ask, you'll get different interpretations of what Adam and Eve's eating the forbidden fruit affect, how it affected them and subsequent uh, humanity especially in terms of the Imago Dei and the curse. Um, Irenaeus in uh, AH 3.23.3 argues that there was no curse placed on Adam and Eve, but rather on the serpent. He goes on to explain that their punishment for sin was the toil of working the earth, childbirth, and so on. Mm -hmm. Was this image of God diminished by their sin? What of the curse? And can you elaborate on what Irenaeus is, is trying to teach us there? Well, we did quite a bit of that today especially with the Adam and Christ typology and so on. Um, so I don't necessarily want to repeat that, but I wouldn't do it in such a static sense of image, you know, was the image, was the image damaged in this set and the other. Um, going back to the thing we spoke about earlier, about Christ on the cross and the serpent on the tree. Yeah, you know, in this case, it's an antitype rather than a type, but the, but the relationship is still there. You know, the Christ and the cross, the cross is a tree of life. The serpent is on the tree promising us life, but in fact, bringing death. Yeah. Um, I, the way that Irenaeus would put it, and many fathers following him, is that um, we snatched, we, 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 our, the, the issue with Adam was that we grasped at life, thinking we could possess life. Yeah, rather than realizing that in order to live, you actually have to die. Taking up the cross and all of it, not living for myself, whatever, yeah? And that's really, you know, in Christian theology, um, we often talk so glibly about Christ destroying death. Yeah, you, know, you know, Christ is in the dead, death is destroyed. Well, is it really true? You know, look around you, people are still dying and you're gonna die still. So it's not as simple as that. Christ has destroyed death, not in the sense of eradicating it, but turning it inside out, making it the very means of victory, trampling down death by death. Yeah, so so powerful that he doesn't just simply eradicate it, he turns it to his use. Okay, 
more correctly would be the, uh, the language in Hebrews, where it says Christ has destroyed the fear of death, which held us bondage. Yeah, it's a fear of death which held us bondage. So what Adam and Eve did is to try and snatch life on their own terms and then try and hold on to it, thinking that by holding on to it, they would live. Rather than realizing that it's in fact by laying down one's life that you in fact begin to live. Yeah, so it's, it's more in that kind of dynamic. Then in book five, chapter 15, I think it's 15, 15.2, he says, um, the reason why Adam, uh, he, he says, in times long past, it was said that Adam was in the image of God, but it was not shown as yet. Therefore, Adam lost the image and likeness. Okay, so it's said that Adam is an image of God, but what the image of God yet it is, is not yet shown. Okay, it's shown when Christ is on the cross. And so not knowing, not seeing that, um, Adam attempted to eat from the tree and lost, lost it. Yeah? And then with regard to the curse and so on, I hope I've addressed that sufficiently today with regard to not plan A, plan B and that kind of thing. And the curse falling upon the serpent, yes, I mean, it plays it out in all sorts of different ways, which is more, more than we need to do here. Uh, one, or, one or two more here. Um, from this morning, uh, Robert writes, I would like to hear Father Bear speak more about the angels ascending and descending. Why <laughs> ascending? <laughs> oh, that's such a complex question. Um, if, you want it, if you want a full examination of that, look at my book on the Gospel of John. Okay, there, there, there are now chapters on that, yeah? But it's connected, it's primarily connected with the fact that the ascending and descending, it's the ascending and descending motif which runs throughout the Gospel of John, okay? It's not just the angels, it's also the Son of Man ascending and descending, yeah? So it's always, always in that way. And really it is the, I think I, I, I point this most clearly in John 6, Christ has to ascend the cross to be able to descend as a heavenly bread. Okay, so ascending, descending. Yeah. Um, I mean, so on, on the one hand, it's simply what the Genesis text says. So what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah. And there are all sorts of Jewish interpretations around that time, which is um, fascinating. You know, it, it's not clear whether it's uh, supposed to be on the ladder or, or upon Jacob, it could be either. And you've got also the Jewish tradition about the angels, you know, on earth with Jacob going up to look at his image in heaven, coming down to check it's really him and, and that kind of thing. Yeah, all, all those passages are quoted in the John book. Okay. Um, here's a question from, uh, this is also from Jeff. Uh, to what degree would you say the gospel uh, was presented and made available to the ancient Hebrew people throughout their history? If it was only an unveiled in Christ, how veiled would it have been for ancient Israel? Um, there, there, there are a number of different things I'd want to say in response to that, really a number, okay? I want to start off with, with addressing the language of veiling and unveiling, first of all. Okay, so it seems to me absolutely inescapable that the way that Paul was reading scripture after his encounter with Christ is different to the way he was reading it before. That's just, you know, and it's not because he didn't know the scripture or that the text had changed. No, he knew the scriptures inside out and the text hadn't changed, but he's now reading it a different way. Yeah. You know, I like to be provocative, so I'd even say, if you're not reading scripture allegorically, you're not reading it as scripture. Yeah, allegorically meaning with the veil lifted. You're reading it as the Lord, the Son of the Prophets, and describing all of that, but you're not reading it with the veil lifted. Allegory simply means, you know, another reading, another, another speaking, okay? But the key point here, the really key point here, is that when the veil is lifted, it's not that you're seeing something else. That's what people fear with regard to the idea of allegory. You know, the veil is lifted and you're now looking at something else apart from the text. Yeah, I would say, you no, know, a better way of thinking about it is to think about ancient reading practices. 
So today we are so fortunate. We've got nicely printed books with spaces between the words, with punctuation, with paragraph breaks, with chapters and all that kind of thing. We don't even need to think about it. But if you look at ancient manuscripts, they didn't. Yeah, you know, the letters are written one after the other with no breaks between words and no punctuation. So in terms of ancient reading, what you had to do, first of all, is make out what letters form what words. You know, I-N, ah, that's a word, in, T-H-E, ah, that's a word, the, B-E-G-I-N-N-I-N-G, beginning, that's a word, yeah? So you first of all got to make out the, look at all the letters, make out the words, and then work out how the words relate to each other and when you come to the end of a sentence, okay? Now, when you do that, um, when, once you've made out the words, in a sense, you no longer look at the individual letters, you're looking at the words. Yeah, you know, when we read today, we just read the words, we don't read the letters, we read the words, yeah? And then likewise, when you get to the end of a sentence, you get the sentence as a whole, yeah? Um, and you see this, you, you capture the sentence as a whole. What you're capturing is not something other than the letters, but you're capturing it as a whole. And also in the real sense, it's only when you get to the end that each word now has its meaning. So, uh, you know, just, just to make that very graphic, a classic example would be the sentence. The plant, okay, the word plant can mean either factory or animals, uh, a factory or, or a plant, a biological, bio, whatever, plant. Um, <laughs> there we go. The, the plant was swarming. Okay, swarming could either apply to um, a factory or to a plant, yeah, with either workers or bees. Whichever word goes there at the end changes the meaning of the word, the plant, at the beginning, yeah. So the meaning, even once you've got the words, the meaning is not given until the end, okay. So we would say, absolutely, the end is Christ's passion. This is when God starts working, this is a Sabbath, this is you know, all the things one can say about that, yeah? And now the whole thing is given meaning, yeah, in that kind of way. It's not that a veil is lifted, oh, we're looking at something else, we're not reading the same thing. No, we're looking at it, but we're now seeing it completely differently, yeah? So it's, first of all, with regard to veiling like that. Um, with regard to the second question, uh, no, the second point I'd want to make with regard to the question, and then in the third question, part would be more difficult. The, the second response I'd want to give to the question is to take the event of the transfiguration, okay? In the transfiguration, as described the Gospel of Luke, Christ goes up to the mountain with the three disciples, and you've got Moses and Elijah on the mountain talk with him. The disciples go up, they see, they see Christ talking with Moses and Elijah, and they fall on their faces. Why? Two questions. Why Moses and Elijah? And why do they fall on their faces? Okay, well, Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets, the living and the dead, various ways you could put it, but the law and the prophets, they're talking with Christ about the exodus he will accomplish in Jerusalem. So the law and the prophets are talking with Christ about his exodus. Yeah. They fall on their faces because, well, who talks on the mountain with Moses and Elijah? Oh, it must be God. That's who he is. Better fall on our faces, yeah? So it's going on like that, that they're seeing him talking on the mountain with Moses and Niger, fall on their faces. When they look up, they just see Christ, okay? And Origen explains it this way. He says, the law and the, the, law and the prophets have become one with the gospel, the exodus that he accomplishes, yeah? So in the light of the passion, before the Passion, we read it as individual books talking about different things, you know, what went on in History Chronicles or whatever else, we read it as different things. In the light of the Passion, it actually all speaks about him, Moses wrote of me, okay? It all becomes gospel. Origen will then go on to say, in the light of the gospel, all things become gospel. Okay, now, how would an ancient Israelite have read it? Well, we can now absolutely say that Moses saw the transfigured Lord on the mountain. No doubt about it. This one he's talking about. The, that, the, that which he saw on the mountain, which he built a copy of below, is the true temple, who is the body of Christ. All that. We can absolutely say that. And we'd want to say absolutely that. Um, Isaiah receiving the coal from the, from the altar 
in the temple, having seen the Lord of Sabaoth, yeah, holy, 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 is exactly the same that we today see receiving the Eucharist from the altar and so on. Okay, same kind of thing. Um, but what maintaining that historical and hermeneutical priority of the turning point for that means that it's always about this one. Yeah, so in the light of Christ, all things become filled with light, but only in the light of Christ. Okay, let's take one final question. And uh, the questions that don't get answered now, I'll uh, forward on to Father John. And if, he, if he'd like to address them uh, in the next session, he, he can do that. Uh, but here's a question. Um, St. Irenaeus says that the Savior pre-existed those who need salvation. This seems to imply that salvation is more than just the forgiveness of sins. Is Irenaeus getting at something closer to theosis? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, no doubt about it. But what's... So, in a sense, the whole movement we've been talking about here, from type to reality, from infancy to maturity, to you know, fully, finally becoming a human being, born into life as a human being, as Ignatius does, and so on, yeah? Um, which Irenaeus sketches out in terms of a whole process of pedagogy and growth. Um, in later term time, that will be spoken about as theosis. Yeah? And there are any number of ways you can play that out. You can talk about it as a movement from image to likeness. We have the image in the beginning must grow into the likeness. It's talking about the same kind of thing, no doubt about it. Yeah? <laughs> What's particularly fascinating for me, though, is the way that they will all in this early period use the word human being to describe it. The result is the living human being born into life. Yeah, That is finally manifest as Ionis, but at the end, God has perfected the living human being. Um, two reasons why I think that's important. Firstly, in some ways that language is more scriptural. In the sense it is, let us make a human being yeah, which is completed by Christ, which then completed by Ignatius and so on, it's, it's that. But it also speaks to us, you know, the language of de uh, deification in a sense, it, it, the language of deification in a sense really starts once you've lost um, another kind of sense for how scripture speaking. Because, you know, to become God, well, you know, we just saw the psalmist saying, you know, I say you are gods, you know, <laughs> and said, what's the big deal with that? Another way of putting it would be to say that the language of human being, is equivalent to the language of son of man. Son of man's an idiom just meaning human being, yeah? But that son of man could be used just to mean to any common everyday human being, or it could be used in an apocalyptic sense that you find in Daniel, yeah? So when Ignatius says, I'm going to become a human being, it's also son of man, okay? Um, scripturally speaking, son of man in that sense is a higher title than son of God. We are so used to thinking of Son of God being a title of Christ in his divinity, Son of Man being a title of Christ in his humanity. We just treat, treat them like that, yeah? But scripturally speaking, Son of Man in that apocalyptic sense is a higher title. Son of God, well, according to scripture, we're all sons of God. I say you are God's son of the most high. I don't doubt it, <laughs> yeah? We don't behave like that. You know, I've begotten sons and they've rejected me. They've done this, that, and the other, yeah? Uh, so on the one hand, um, it's actually speaking more in that scriptural language in the earliest way, Ignatius, Irenaeus, and so on. But on the other hand, I think that in some ways it's even more important for us today because the question for us today is really, what is it to be human anyway? Yeah, transhumanism, posthumanism, end of humanism, all, all that kind of thing. What is it to be human? And then as we get into the next lecture, so what does male and female have to do with being human? Yeah, and then all of those kind of questions. So it offers us food for thought. Oh, that's all I'll say. <laughs> well, thank you uh, again. We will, um, I think we'll cut it off there. I will uh, see to it that you get the other questions from, mm -hmm. from other folks who have asked and maybe some of them will be answered in the next, uh, in the next yeah. lecture as well. Yeah, I'm not going to talk for as long in the next lecture. So we'll have more time for discussion. Uh, and we'll have we'll have the I final lecture from as well, yeah. from uh, from Father John as well as uh, a few questions from our faculty panel, 
and then depending on how the time works out, we may ask some more as well. Yep. Um, so with without further ado, we'll we'll take a little break here and we'll gather back again um, at one o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thanks so much. <laughs>